Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Thanks, Sylvia, for a great session on the Backbone Organization. Um, just a reminder, for those of you who just want to have a different look, uh, go up into your view. And you can go side by side gallery, which then you see everyone on screen, or side by side speaker, and you just see the person speaking. I find sometimes it's nice in a three hour session that you can go between the two. Sometimes you like to see all the faces on online, and sometimes it's easier just to follow the speaker. Isaac, if you want to bring up the, the slides here for mutually reinforcing activities, that would be great. Yes, you can just take the next one. You know, I, um, I'm never sure uh, if I wanna teach this as getting to impact or mutually reinforcing activities. And I, I, I questioned uh, John Kanya when, when, when they wrote the, the document, to say really, what are we talking about here? And, and it's really about doing the work. It's about implementing the work. Next slide. You know, as we move into this work, it's, it's, it's interesting because all kinds of questions start arising. And, and um, each day these occurred, and I ask you to open one and Yasmin said, who is currently working on the same agenda and how can we come together? Joseph asks, are we patient enough to follow this approach? Helen asks, how do I apply this on an existing project where there are some structures in place? What adjustments do I need to make to apply collective impact? Jody asks, who is my collective? Sahana asks, what does efficiency mean? Samuel asks, is collective impact workable where I work? And Claudine asks, collective impact seems to come more naturally to some than others. How do we win them over? And, you know, it's interesting because these are the kinds of questions. And as, you know, the other many that I have um, up top from the last session we did, helps us to begin to, to think through there are lots of technical issues as we're moving through this. Next slide. And, you know, each of these buckets or, you know, um, is, is really around these five elements. They're just a way of describing different angles on the same thing. How do we achieve large scale change? How do we work differently? How do we mobilize our community? Next slide. And I, I think to myself, you know, we teach this work um, and if only it were that easy, you know, if it was only as easy as teaching it and then you listening to it and then you going away and doing it. But I think what you need to do is often just trust yourself. If this work resonates with you, what that means is that you're part of a learning journey. And as you're learning together um, around how to do this, things start to make more sense. Next slide. So here is an interesting slide uh, for you to observe. Um, what you have here is, is kind of our take on what happens. And in some ways, this happens over a, you know, like phase one and phase two, uh, it could take a better part of a year. Um, you know, phase three is kind of the end of the first year or often at the end of 18 months. Um, but look at, you know, what we call the pre-launch phase. Uh, where you have a core team of local cross-sector stakeholders uh, start to talk about whether collective impact is the right approach. So that's what you're thinking right now. And you'll start to bring a small group of people together and you'll start asking some questions. Does it make sense 
for us to move in a collective impact way. You're probably going to hold a lot of dialogues about the issue in the community, um, looking for uh, just, you know, what is the issue um, in, in our community? Who is my collective? And that starts to emerge. And, um, and then you're kind of looking about, you know, are we ready for this? But it, it takes time. I guess that's what I'm, I'm suggesting here. In phase two, you start to initiate some action and you're getting yourself ready for impact. And, um, you know, around community involvement, you're starting to engage the community to help frame the common agenda. Um, and you're starting to identify the key people that are going to get involved and you're getting a better handle on the issue. You can really start yourself, feel yourself kind of settling into the work and the group starts to come together. Normally, phase two starts at about mm, the four month or the six month period, depending if you're working at it formally or informally. Um, phase three, is is often kind of in the six months to 18 months. It can take a long time to get through phase one and two. And often um, you might decide not to use collective impact approach. But when you do, you start to look at, okay, I need to create a backbone infrastructure, uh, a leadership team, probably a staff team, um, some action teams, a data team, a listening team and you work toward uh, finalizing that common agenda and you have built quite a network of people who care about what you're doing. You're kind of building a community momentum and you start to establish your population level goals, which is the, the shared measurement that we talked about yesterday. Next slide. So, you know, I, um, I, I like to kind of think about it this way, if we're going to do this work together and I, I have a board, some of you have a boss, my board is my boss. And, you know, if I want to do something like this, they're going to ask me why a collective impact, okay? And what will you achieve in the first year? They often don't like me to talk in five years. What are you going to do in the first year? And um, I normally start with this little quote that I have in here from myself. I say, like, we've been working on poverty for a long time. Or maybe the folks at play you know, might say, We've been working on every child in Singapore thriving for a long time. And we have lots of ideas. But in my poverty work, I would say we've been working at this for a long time, but I'm not satisfied with the progress. We want to do more. And we think that a collective impact approach will allow us to do more, to have a better impact than what we're having now. And all around my board at this point, I see heads nodding. They like that idea. And that's really what we're getting into collective impact for. If we were satisfied with the status quo, we probably wouldn't be interested in collective impact. We want to do better. We want to do more. Next slide. The next thing I would say to my board is I want to remind you that this is a complex issue. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, Again, I'm going to the, I just want to use this issue of Singapore, a place where every child thrives. You know, it's, it's, a, it's not 
something we all agree upon, what it means to thrive. Parents might think differently than teachers. Governments might define thriving differently than maybe business owners. And so when we start looking at a whole community and we all want children to thrive, it's not that easy just to say it. We all kind of agree with the sentiment, but it's complex. And we need time to talk together, to learn from the different sectors so that we can begin to understand. And I often say we need to move into a moment of unknowing in order for us to start to come to a common understanding and agreement on what thriving means. There's a lot of interconnected issues. Thriving could mean health. It could mean education. It could mean a deeper sense of community and belonging. It could mean family. Um, there are so many issues and all of them matter. So we can't just focus on one of those and expect that if we have healthy children, they're thriving. Health is only one indicator of thriving. And of course it's important to all of us, but all of these issues are important to all of us. And therefore it requires many stakeholders. We all need to work together. We need to bring the parents and the teachers and love different levels of government and the business owners together around the same table to learn together, to talk together and to work together in a mutually reinforcing way. Because when we do that, we have the potential to see all sides of the issue and we can move all of Singapore forward together around thriving children. The other thing we need to recognize is that this issue of thriving is also dynamic. You know, if we would have talked about thriving pre-COVID, we probably would have talked very boldly. But then during COVID, it maybe became narrower. Thriving was just saying, healthy, not getting COVID, um, but also kids not being able to go to school and figuring out what all that meant. So there's all these things. So you can just say something. I mean, I know it's not simple, but in a sense, you put something like COVID into the environment and thriving takes on a different element. A child, gets a, a child has a disability. Thriving might mean something different there as well. And that is also an evolving approach but it's dynamic and things like uh, family stability and community well-being, just the environment where a child grows up in can affect a lot of their thinking system um, and it can affect their, um, their well-being, their health and well-being. And, and that has to do then again with this unique, uh, it is somewhat unique to their local context. It, different neighborhoods, Children are thriving differently. Even in, in different faith groups, thriving could mean different things. So it's kind of a, a unique thing. And, and, and for this reason, we need to bring diversity into unity. We need to bring all of us together to have a serious conversation and to come up with a plan on how we are gonna collectively work to ensure that all children are thriving in Singapore. Next slide. More so, we, in order to really do this, uh, we need to keep remembering that we're working at a systems level. Um, and so we're changing the way that people come at this. Um, so it's not that we are, like we, we feel that we want to move away from a deficit based, right? So what we don't want children to do to more of an asset based, what do we want children to be able to do? We're thinking toward a positive future. 
we want to also create from a competitive environment or from a sense that we're all working in different sectors, so therefore we don't need to work together, we wanna create and build a greater trust in the system because trust itself allows us to collaborate. We wanna to start to understand this issue in a collective way and data is a fairly neutral source. When we bring forward good data, it's easier often for us all to talk together, which is something that collective impact, I think has really brought to the community development field that we use data as a gateway uh, for better conversations. It's more neutral. The other thing we wanna do is we wanna start to build energy and momentum around this issue. And maybe even most importantly, when we all start talking together, all start working together, we start to find blind spots and we start to eliminate the constraints. It's very interesting. Uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, they took this very seriously and they called their program Opportunities Iowa and they saw their number one job was to lift the constraints that helped people from thriving, particularly low-income people uh, from thriving in their community. They wanted to lift the constraints that were holding people back. Next slide. Next slide. So one of the things we wanna do is we wanna build a team. And so in the first year, uh, we wanna kinda know who are the people that are at the center of this? Um, Jody asked, who is my team? Well, that's what we have to figure out. Who are the small group of people that are gonna change the world, right? And so we need to find people who agree with us that collective impact is a good approach. And we start to talk about that. We start to build trust in the system by bringing different sectors together and having conversations. Um, we start to really develop uh, the, the outreach because what we understand, it's not just about ideas. It's about a whole lot of different people agreeing on a common agenda and a common future. And we also want to build capacity. But let's go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to just pass over this one for the sake of time and go to the next one because it's the most important one. So here we have kind of our mutual reinforcing activities. And um, what, what you start to see is that when collective impact is working at, a, at an action level, we wanna to bring together as much as possible cross-sector teams, all my action teams. We'll have people from business, government, voluntary, people with lived experience. Uh, it will always have those people talking together, planning together. And when we start looking at mutually and, and forming action teams together. So if I have an action team around thriving children and one of my action teams is health, I want that action team to have people with lived experience probably parents of children that should be thriving, uh, business leaders that agree with that premise, government leaders, and community development leaders or not-for-profit leaders. I want all my action teams to have that and I want my health team to have that. Um, so what's gonna happen is that we're gonna develop a number of strategies, even early on, where we think we need to really work together to improve outcomes, could be health, education, et cetera. And we wanna to start to form strategy and action teams around each one of these to help us to, to learn and to consider what needs to be done on a systemic level. And so we start to then think about mutually reinforcing activities. And one of my favorite examples is uh, when, when we wanted to start working in our campaign around better jobs for low-income workers, 
we clearly understood that we needed an action team that would have some government leaders in it because we needed government to make some changes to labor laws. We needed employers to hire differently, to pay better, and to commit to, ad to advancement. So we needed employers around the table who were committed to better jobs for low-income workers. We needed the schools involved because we needed to improve the skills and the training for low-income workers. And then we needed workers themselves involved, right, who were advancing the ideas of taking initiative, improving work and technical skills that they needed to advance. So you can see when everyone's working together, all of those uh, groups are connecting and they're in dialogue and they each bring their own, I guess, both agendas, but also they bring their knowledge. Then they start to tackle the problem together. And it's very unique what begins to happen. And that's kind of the mutual reinforcing work because the government people suddenly know that there is a program that they already have in place that if it was implemented better, it could have a better impact for this group. Um, schools start to say, okay, we're going to run some pilot training programs. And the employers are saying, well, we should, we will hire those workers. Um, and on and on it goes. And it's that kind of work that starts to happen in almost every category. And then there is kind of this, this process of learning, changing together. Um, so it's about, we do things together, then we stop, bring everyone together. We think about what we're doing. Then we plan some more, then we do some more. Then we think some more, then we plan some more, then we do some more. And it just keeps growing upward and upward as we call an upward spiral of activity. Next slide. So again, you know, I come back to Des Moines, Iowa, because I always like to keep one example uh, kind of running through um, uh, the group. And, um, you know, it's just, it's an interesting example of, of a group that came together and identified who was needed in the community to move the issue of, of opportunities for low-income people forward. Um, and they, they caught on early this need for multi-sectoral roundtables. And they embraced this idea that diversity mattered. Diverse opinions, diverse position, diverse power, all of that mattered. And if we were going to create a systemic change, we needed the whole community to work together. More on that later. Next slide. And then I just put some extra slides in here. Just let's go through them, Isaac, this one and this one. And so it's just around engagement, uh, continuous communication and governance. They're just slides for your own use um, at a later time. Okay, what I want you to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you go into groups of three. And in those groups of three, I want you to each answer one of these questions and you get four minutes. There's no right or wrong. You don't have to repeat what I just said. But if you're thinking of implementing a collective impact, where do you want to start here? Are you going to talk about who your partners are going to be, what you want to complete in the first 12 months, or how will you explain this collective impact idea to your boss? Groups of three each take about three or four minutes to answer one of these questions. Isaac, can we put people into groups of three and come back at 9.30? Hi, welcome back, everyone. Jody, do you want to give us a sense of what you guys talked about in your group? Ken, I think we uh, 
for us, it was like trying to shift our brains a little bit because um, our board and our, our boss are very much like into this collective impact thing. So it was like, okay, I, let's, let's try and figure out how to, to reinforce it. Um, but yeah. And then we talked a bit about like, yeah, re-identifying partners, like, and really who are the specific ones that would be useful. Now. So your board is already on site. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Very good. Sadhana, how about your group? Hi, my name. Good morning. Um, Joseph, Sarah, and I had a really interesting discussion about um, players and participants and also cultural, culturally how we perceive change and who are the primary movers of, of, of change when it comes to collective impact. And so in terms of players, the, 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 the group of people that often get ignored because we are so caught up in trying to implement collective change. We're talking about VWs, we're talking about governments, government agencies, but we don't talk about like the very people that we're trying to help and they are so integral to the process. But when we talk about them, we talk about them as if they are like an entity. You know, we're trying to help this group of people so let's work with all these different people to help this group of people but um, sometimes we just need to reintegrate them back into the, the, the collective in, impact framework and recognize that they are the key players and we need to involve them to understand their needs and they need to be involved in these conversations as well um, and possibly even be made in the center of the conversation because true change happens there um, and the other thing we were talking about which was quite interesting is uh, we we're talking about how sometimes it is um, government, I mean, look to gov the government as a paternalistic figure to tell us, so to give us solutions. And they are the primary movers of change and everything revolves around um, these kind of organizations, which or, or, or well, the government, you know. So culturally, I think we tend to look to hierarchical uh, structures as opposed to bottom-up collective impact uh, type movements to, to implement change. And to change this mindset is really a cultural shift because from, I mean, from, for a very, very long time, we tend to look to the government to tell us what, what to do. Like, oh, must wear masks. Okay, we'll wear masks. So you must do, you know, ART. Okay, we'll do our ART, you know. But if, if, if we really want collective impact from a different perspective, as in from a bottom-up type of uh, perspective, um, then we need to look at how, uh, look at, re look at these hierarchical structures and maybe invert it, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, so that, that was... Yeah, we we, we in, in Canada, we call that citizen-led, you know, citizen-led change, which is kind of a, a reversal because we also have to go through a cultural shift around sort of government being the driver of, of change because they were often the funder to it becoming more citizen-led. And that took time. Excellent. Very good. Um, others uh, on your, your thoughts, um, uh, around what happened in your group. Um, let me see um, if I can go ahead. So Paul, yeah, just very quickly, just a quick thought on choice of partners. So uh, one thing that comes up is sometimes you may not always want to pick partners who are the most proactive as well. Uh, you could be working in a disadvantaged place where there's a strong organized crime element there as well. So just to engage, um, so exam example, if you're doing to do work, it may be good to actually just touch base uh, with them just to give the space uh, to allow people to come in as well. Uh, we did a, a collab with um, a, a nonprofit who was helping street walkers in one of the red light districts. And uh, uh, we had to like kind of inform um, the pimps in the area that uh, we're doing a mobile legal clinic uh, for some of the street walkers as well, but let's kind of explain our presence. So in other words, it was not like a, a really integrated partnership, but we viewed them as not, if they don't do anything, that's actually good. That provides a safe space for us to uh, do the collab itself. Uh, so maybe just that that, that that analysis in terms of who could be your potential partners in terms of, um, you know, the interventions you want to do. Absolutely. Yeah, we often call them unusual suspects. Um, and, um, you know, there's a, a very interesting story about um, it, when, when AIDS was at its peak in Brazil, um, Brazil was able to reduce uh, the evidence of AIDS by almost 50%, whereas other countries were doing less than 20%. 
And when they started to look what happened, it was the nuns in Brazil that promoted condom use. So it was a very interesting, uh, it's kind of like when a nun tells you to use a condom, you will over others. You know what I mean? It was just this interesting partnership that was created in the most unlikely partner in the AIDS fight, right? They would all think that the, the nuns would judge, but the nuns cared and created this kind of positive environment. It, it was it was quite quite lovely and remarkable. Uh, time for one more. Uh, questions that arose, ideas that came up uh, in your group. I'm looking at Ching Ming. Um, I think like, um, I think one thing that kind of stood out to me um, also when we were sharing was, um, I had this thought initially as well at the beginning um, is this, this course that kind of made me realize that a lot of times when we are working with partnerships or um, anything or any project in a way, um, a lot of times the collective agenda is missing or it has often been kind of dictated. So it isn't really like a collective agenda. And um, in a way that, that kind of, I don't know, sometimes I think it puts us in the position where it's like, we know that this is good work and we know that this is the work that we want to take forth, but also wrestling with the fact that um, perhaps this, agenda, collective agenda that's been dictated or given to us is really not, um, it's not as deep as we think it could go. It could go further. And I guess, yeah, in a way, sometimes I think we wrestle with that as well. Yeah. Trying to decide, like, do, do we continue this participation or how do we kind of shift conversations to uh, achieve something further? Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Um, I wish we had lots more time for conversation because I'd love to get into your questions, but we're going to have a little time for that next. And Sylvia wants to take you through kind of looking at what do we mean by impact and how do we measure it? But why don't we take like a, a five minute break? Why don't we come back kind of at uh, not at in about yeah five minutes 